Yisrael Medad is an Israeli journalist and author. He was the former director of educational programming and information resources right here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. He has served as a parliamentary aide to Knesset member Geula Cohen and as an advisor of international affairs to cabinet minister Yuval Neeman. Medad has been profiled in the BBC and Haaretz, and his work has appeared in the LA Times, Jerusalem Post, and Herald Tribune, and more than all of that, he's just an amazing, humble, and modest man who I have the pleasure to have met a few times now. Thank you so much for coming. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you for inviting me here this morning. Um, my job is a little bit more difficult than everybody else. I have to deal with a very dry subject called uh, history, politics, uh, diplomacy, uh, and all the other things that um, are necessary uh, to get up above the ground. So uh, I've tried uh, to shorten about 1,800 years of history. Uh, it's a bit difficult because in rereading most of the stuff I've read over the past 48 years uh, on the subject, I kept on reminding myself, oh, I have to do that, I have to do that, and I realized that uh, I'll be running out of time. So uh, let me start by saying uh, that the United Nations is a great body. It doesn't know what it does, but it's a great body. Last week, in honor of this conference, specifically timed, they decided that, let me see if I can see this here. There's no, there's no light up here, right? So I have to squint. Uh, that, uh, anything here? No. All right. The assembly reiterates that any actions by Israel to impose its laws, jurisdiction, and administration on the holy city of Jerusalem are illegal and therefore null and void. It also stresses the need for the parties to observe calm and restraint. Anybody remember last year and the uh, mego, whatever they call themselves, the uh, metal detectors on the Temple Mount? And to refrain from provocation, provocative actions, and calls for respect for the historic status at status quo at Jerusalem's holy places. And therefore, they decided that regarding the holy places of Jerusalem, including the Haram Sharif, Sharif, and urging restraint, and stuff like that. Well, anyway, the point is, as you probably know, because you're very concerned and very well read, that somehow the Temple Mount was missing from that decision. And this is, you want me to use this? Look at that. <laughs> is there anybody here could have some lights on the stage? No, okay. <laughs> the second thing, uh, so you got my point, right? The second thing is just this morning, I received a message from Dr. Eyal Davidson. Dr. Eyal Davidson, besides being a scholar of Jerusalem, etc., happens to be the director of a new project called the Jewish Heritage on the Temple Mount Unit within the Ministry of Culture. And the website will be up hopefully within a week or so so that you can all be educated in addition to everything else I and everybody else has said here this morning and will say later on this afternoon. Uh, so that's a major move because it's something funded by the Israel government. So on the one hand, while the government unfortunately ha has a uh, status quo uh, policy, and I'll get into that a little bit later, so you understand what's going on. Uh, on the other hand, we managed uh, with the help of Yehuda Glick and other members of Knesset and other people, to urge the government to get involved in doing something positive about the Temple Mount from a Jewish 
and a lovers of Zion, non-Jewish point of view, about what's going on in the Temple Mount. Um, regarding the point about where the Temple Mount is, okay, uh, I'm not a professional archaeologist or, 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 or a scientific background on this issue, but anybody who claims that Mount Moria is anywhere except on the other side of the Western Wall, and that the temples, Solomon's, the first one, the second one, uh, which was then extended by Herod, which sometimes people call the third temple, if I'm not mistaken, was anywhere else except there, is wrong. Okay, there's, there's no... The previous speaker mentioned duality. Uh, I'm a Unitarian on this one, okay? There's only one answer, all right? The, the, let me see what I wrote down here, okay? Topography, the sources, the archaeology, the history, the documents, the architecture, ritual memories, literature, visitors, both Jewish and non-Jewish, over the ages. The warning inscription that we have outside of Israel at the present moment. The, the Kia inscription, the, the sounding of the chauffeur inscription that was found. Um, token vouchers that were picked up. Um, uh, the golden bell that was found in, 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 in the site. The mikvaot, the, rich, the ritual baths. Uh, the eastern wall uh, masonry. Um, refuse pots. Okay, water systems, seals, the half shekel coin, everything that was discovered, four pavings. Everything indicates that you can rest assured that when you go through the one gate that non-Jews, non-Muslims are allowed to go through, okay, which is now called after, uh, unfortunately, a child who was stabbed to death by an Arab, Halel, Ariel, that you are on the Temple Mount. And if I could lead a, uh, a, a guided tour up there without the police sitting on top of my uh, back, uh, that would be a lot easier to explain. So, okay, that's off the table. I've, I've treated that. So the first, I, I try to boil, boil down my remarks to three main issues. The first one basically I got off with, I think, very well. Where was the temple? On the Temple Mount. Okay, it's kind of easy. So keep that in mind. It's not called the Temple Mount because the temple was, according to Yasser Arafat, somewhere in Saudi Arabia or in Jericho uh, or, you know, it, it's kind of funny also, if you think about it, okay, the only place where we know that the Arabs don't know where Jerusalem is is the Quran because they claim that Al-Aqsa in the Quran is somewhere up in the Temple Mount, which even the Quran doesn't admit to. And uh, Professor Dr. Kedar uh, uh, has, has given several lectures on the subject, exactly where it is somewhere between Mecca and Medina. The second thing I want to do with you is to, you, in order to understand the current political diplomatic issues, why you are being followed, or if you mention the temple instead of the mosque too many times, you might get yelled at, uh, if your lips move too regular, uh, then you'll be um, upbraided uh, and all sorts of other things. I'm going to go through some of the political issues uh, because I think it's, it, it's a matter that not too many people are aware of. And if you don't get it from me, you're not going to get it. Everybody else on the, today's program will probably deal with everything else you want to, to need. I was picked to do something very specific. Um, and so that you can understand... Uh, what that is, and of course, I'll start with a, I'll try to condense uh, uh, briefly the history because I think it's uh, an issue that will give you confidence um, in, in, in believing what you believe and in doing what you will be doing if you haven't been doing it already. Uh, just to give you a little bit of humbleness, I probably have been thrown off the Temple Mount more times than some people here have been on it. So, you know, you, there's a scale here which you have to uh, uh, attain. You're starting low, some of you. 
work your way up and everything will be okay. But the first thing I want to do is be serious for a moment and recall two Jews. One I do not know the name of. He was a blind Sephardi Jew who used to go from Kfar Shiloh, David's, uh, the city of David that you know today, up the hill into the old city. And he would walk to one of the four, what we call the four Sephardi synagogues that were built over the centuries, now located in the Jewish quarter. And he would uh, say some uh, psalms, as was usual. He was blind, okay, so everything was by heart. And uh, he would walk back. It seems at one point in, in January of 1871, he got lost and most probably walked into the Temple Mount because he was found the next day thrown over the wall at the very bottom, and that's how he died. We don't know his name. I, I looked up the newspaper, Halivanon. Uh, the issue simply says, the blind Swaradi Tehillim Sayer probably got lost and walked in. Another, the other Jew I want to mention is um, Asher Itzkovich, Itzkovitz, who on the last day, what we call the seventh day of Pesach, Passover, as you know in Israel we do not celebrate eight days, we celebrate seven, because we know where we are, outside they're, they're kind of lost on time and space and location. <laughs> Spacey. And um, he had survived the Holocaust. He arrived in Israel in 46, if I'm not mistaken, from Czechoslovakia. And he and his friend had come up from Tel Aviv to celebrate the holiday. And they walked from the area of near Meir Sharim. For those who know Jerusalem well, you come down, you go to the, to the, the Damascus Gate, Shar Shem, as we know it in, in Hebrew, and began walking straight down the street towards the Kotel area. Again, he made a mistake like the other one and turned left into one of the gates of the Temple Mount, if I'm not mistaken, the Majlis Gate, where the Waqf offices are, and he was beaten to death. April 1947. So uh, I did that simply because there is a history to the Temple Mount. And it's not just about a struggle that started after 67, and we should always be aware that we're only continuing the history. And you can only continue the adventure of history if you know what came before you. If you don't, you'll find out you're up a tree too high and you'll fall off. You need the roots, okay? I could have mentioned also four Franciscan monks. And I will do that in the spirit of Jewish Christian solidarity. In 15, 39, I think, but in, that, in the 16th century, okay, they decided to preach to the Qadi on the Temple Mount. And when they say preach, they weren't talking about Muhammad and they weren't talking about Moses. They were arrested, they were taken to the Kishla up by the uh, Jaffa Gate, and after two or three days of beatings, they were decapitated, quartered, burnt. Nothing left of them. They're called the Four Martyrs of Jerusalem in the Franciscan Order. So sometimes, not only Yehuda Glick can be in, in trouble because of dealing with the Temple Mount, in history we've known other instances. To the subject at hand. The first thing you have to remember is that Jerusalem has been conquered, occupied, and the Jewish population repressed ever since the fall of the Second Temple. That includes the Bar Kokhba revolt, includes the Romans, it includes the Byzantines, it includes the Persians, uh, the Arabs who came out of Arabia, not from Palestine, they came out of Arabia and they came here. And then the Crusaders and the Mongols and the Mamluks, uh, it goes on and on, and every single one of them did something with Jerusalem. In some cases, actually, we have a very positive attitude. There was a Byzantine emperor, uh, emperor 
uh, who decided that it came time for the Jews to rebuild the Temple Mount. And we know that for a couple of months, there were attempts to do that until probably an earthquake uh, upset the issue. There were several up, uh, earthquakes over the years. The last one was in 1927, um, which actually uh, helped us a bit because two things happened. Uh, and not too many people were at that. A fellow by the name of Hamilton, who was the chief archaeologist of the British Mandate, managed to get under the floor of the El Aqsa Mosque and find what was underneath some of the floor uh, coverings, uh, which revealed inscriptions and, and pictures and all sorts of things like that. And the second thing was that some of the beams that had held up the roof of the Al Aqsa Mosque were taken down. Later on, they were analyzed, uh, and we found out that several of them, I'm not, no, I don't know if it was more than three or four, probably have an age of the first temple. Okay, you're talking about Hiram, or Hiram as I would uh, uh, pronounce it, uh, one of the kings of uh, Lebanon. Uh, and so um, we're talking about a, a, an actual history. Um, it was alluded to before that some of us have too much belief in a spiritual sense. I'm talking about things that you can touch, things that you can analyze, things that you pick up a piece of paper and look at. So I'm, I'm trying to stay on the ground on this issue. So that was very uh, judicious uh, uh, discovery for us. Sometimes earthquakes can be a, a good thing. Not always. Um, we do know, and I think this goes to my first point about we know where the Temple Mount was. Despite restrictions and prohibitions and persecution, Jews were always striving and getting to and inside the Temple Mount at different times over those 1800 years. Jews were able to ascend during, especially Tisha B'Av, during certain periods. The Muslims even permitted them to oil the stone, okay, as a element of probably laughing at the one time that we get to respect the site. But there was a synagogue on the Temple Mount. We know that the Rambam, Maimonides, was on the Temple Mount. Uh, we have Jewish and non-Jewish visitors attesting to all sorts of people being there, and so, yes, there was a prohibition from about 1260 or so, and then it was redone uh, just after the, um, uh, the um, Ottoman Empire uh, conquest of Jerusalem in the early 16th century, and only began to loosen itself somewhere in the middle of the 19th century. But Jews managed to get there, and other people did also manage to get there. And don't forget, as the Ridba at the Radbaz mentions, uh, Ravi da David Ben Zimra, who actually came from Egypt, you can go up on some of the houses bordering the Western Wall, north of the Western Wall, and from there look inside. Okay? No, well, they didn't have drones then. Okay, it was kind of difficult, right? But you could see, and there's a physicality in terms of how much is inside in terms of measurement, how many square meters, how many less than square meters, is it like that? And over the ages, measurements have been done and traditions have been strengthened. Rabbi Gorin in, in, in the last century was very thorough in his uh, measurements and we have all sorts of documents. So it's not a matter, uh, I was, when I first started with the Temple Mount 48 years ago, just, just a few years ago, I know I, all right. We approached a rabbi, who shall remain unnamed, who said, you know, there are a lot more problems about the prohibition on work or labor during the Sabbath than it is to solve the problem of how to get into the Temple Mount. It's just a matter of wanting to. It's just a matter of, of wishing to, okay? If you will it, it can be. Someone said that once about a state. So uh, we can do it, we, we can do it, just a matter of, 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 of getting up a little bit more fortitude, a little bit relaxing on some of the issues, uh, and it can be done. 
Um, we have, as I said, inscriptions on the Temple Mount. I brought all sorts of pictures of them. We'll leave that behind. If I put something up, it take takes away attention from myself. So uh, I'm not going to do that. Let me jump now, because I think Steve, I would like to say some things you probably, I would like to say, and you would like to hear. On the 15th of January, 1918, in the British House of Parliament, uh, a member of Parliament named Mr. King asked whether, in consideration for the sentiments of Muslim subjects of the British Empire, it will be provided under the new regime established or to be established in Palestine that unrestricted Muslim control is secured of such holy places as the Haram as Sharif in Jerusalem and the sanctuary over the cave of Mahpalah at Hebron, being places regarded as part of the birthright of the Mohammedan world. That was his like parliamentary question. Now, from this question, you understand where we are today, a hundred years later, hundred almost one hundred and one years later, if my math is correct. Okay. In other words, one religion has the ultimate exceptional right to a holy place. I read you from the United Nations decision last week as if we don't exist. We, okay, and you too, actually. Right? We have no rights, we have no history, we have no national identity, we have no religious sentiment. Just wash it away, okay? It was once a threshing floor, and now it's a mosque. The only thing I liked about Ehud Barak at the Camp David II summit in 2000, for some of you who were alive then, when Arafat, I don't know if you remember that, that issue there, but they, did, they wanted to divide the Temple Mount, above ground Muslims, below ground uh, Jews. And I kept on getting itchy about that because the only thing below ground for me is a grave. So I, I didn't like, you know, I didn't like the intimidation about it. But at one point, as I mentioned earlier, Arafat began saying it's somewhere else. I don't know, Jericho, Saudi Arabia, anywhere else but where he didn't want it to be. And I heard Barak said, when Jesus overturned the tables of the moneylenders, he wasn't in a mosque. <laughs> from, so, as you can see from this short exchange in the parliament, the British, already from 1915, when they decided to include the Ottoman Empire, Palestine, in one of the war fronts eventually, okay, that Muslim control over the mosque, over Omar, as they call it then in the language, was to be secured. In other words, we, had, we didn't have a, a chance, okay, between you and me. History passed us by at that moment. We managed to get the Balfour Declaration. Everything else, in terms of the intensity, the strength of our historic religious spiritual connection to this land was left somewhere else on the table, okay? So that when Jerusalem was taken in December of 1917, immediately a division or unit, a platoon of Muslim soldiers from the Indian regiments that served with the British were placed on the Temple Mount, no one non-Muslim goes in. Not that at that time there was too much of a Jewish effort to get in because historically speaking, religiously speaking, and I think psychologically speaking, since the past 400 years Jews had not been admitted, too many Jews accepted that that was the reality. So why bother about it? There were attempts at that time and a few years later to buy either the walkway in front of the Temple Mount at the Kotel, 
or even to buy the Kotel, the Western Wall itself. But the Mufti put an end to that in 1925 already. And then when the 1929 riots broke out, violence, Temple Mount, shut it down. Don't punish those who are violent. Consider their violence as something that will help you, uh, what was the United Nations say? Not to be provocative. On um, Rosh Hashanah of 1928, there was an issue which led, I'm going to cut things short, an issue which led to the establishment of an official status quo on the Temple Mount. Many people do not know there was a British white paper of late November 1928, which set out a series of rules. And then after the riots, it was augmented. And so that Jews, if they brought chairs, they had to take them away. If they brought benches, they had to be portable, they had to be taken away. Lanterns at night had to be taken away. Only during Shabbat could they stay overnight. Partitions between the sexes taken away. And you couldn't for sure blow the shofar at the end of the Yom Kippur uh, service. So from 1928-1929, you have, I don't know how to describe it, psychological, emotional, whatever, sense that the British have established a status quo. We only get to pray at the Kotel. We have nothing to do with the Temple Mount. Push it off. And as many ultra-Orthodox have done, push it off till Messiah comes. Why get involved with that? And it's understandable. I don't accept it, but it's understandable. And so, a week and a half after the Six Days War, Moshe Dayan goes up to the Temple Mount, walks into El Aqsa, sits down with the Mufti and the Qadi, he has a friend who speaks Arabic, David Farhi, next to him. And they re-establish that status quo, which basically reads, Muslims administer the location from the walls in and control everything that goes on, on there. Jews can come in as visitors, not as owners, not as something else that you might want to call us, through one gate only. Um, so in my youth, I have chained myself to the railing of the steps going down to ancient El Aqsa, underneath El Aqsa. I have pictures of me dragging, like being dragged like a sack of potatoes outside. I don't do that now. My bones are not set up for all that rugged activity. Okay, so the issue is, are we second-class citizens? <laughs> when, I, when our opponents all over the world claim that, everybody believes them on college campuses, in the United Nations, in other international legal forums, right? Of course, Arabs are second-class citizens in the state of Israel. It's obvious. I claim to be second-class in just one small area of 144 square dunams, Right? No one wants to believe me, or if they do, they think, not now, that's political. It's theirs. We signed a peace treaty with Jordan, which is not upheld, where religious tolerance, respect for the holy places in Jerusalem ought to be honored. You can look it up on Google. Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, Article 9. And yet, our Prime Minister, led by a former Secretary of State, John Kerry, had to go and, and make a public announcement in October of 2015 that the status quo remains. Jews visit, Muslims pray. The background, again, is all through the British mandate. And of course, being separated from Jerusalem for 19 years, don't let us forget that, the city was divided. In its 3,000 year history, 19 years the city was separated, and now they want to do that forever and ever. What is 19 years and 3,000? 
I mean, it doesn't even make sense logically speaking. So in the short, my short version, that's what we come up with. We come up with the fact that simply because Jews were not sovereign, because Jews were regarded as something different, and for too many years Jews were regarded as to be put, held down at a lower level or at an other standard of activity, that when we finally came back to reestablish our state, to build it, to develop it, and then to be able to be in Jerusalem once again after being uh, separated for those 19 years, we still could not expect to receive at least the equal rights of everybody else who should be able to be there. And by the way, Christians too. I have a good few Christian friends who have made the mistake, in quotation marks, of opening up a Bible, right, to find out where they are or to recall events, and they're on the other side of the wall before they turn around another page, uh, or worse. So I think, and I think in this case, for sure I'm with uh, Rabbi, member of Knesset, or member of Knesset Rabbi Yehuda Glick, that this could be a place of reconciliation of coexistence, of mutual respect, even of compromise. Any, how many people have not been up on the Temple Mount? Oh, you're brave. Uh, to raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody who's been there knows there's such empty spaces all over the world in that little spot. You could start. You want, you want my suggestion? It got the wax a little bit upset, so I'll get you upset too. If you remember, when you come in through that gate, just to the left, there a, begins a colonnaded uh, avenue or corridor, okay, in which the machkum is on top, and then it goes all the way up to the north. The machkum building is a border police station. All you have to do is to put thick perspex, one-way glass, or whatever you want to call it, along those colonnades for about, say, 50 meters or so, open up a small hole, wall, small hole in the wall of the machkama, and you can have a synagogue which the Muslims don't even see the Jews. It wouldn't even bother them to see people praying to God. They wouldn't even notice our dirty feet that are defiling their mosque area, according to Mahmoud Abbas from two years ago. Nice guy. There are so many other ways to solve the problem imaginatively. But I understand they feel threatened. They know that a lot of what they say is empty, untrue, non or ahistorical, and would sort of crumble a lot of what they have built in terms of the mythology of who they are and what they are, and etc., and would solve a lot of problems also of terror. But the reality is, the history has indicated for them that when Jews seek out that site, whether it's a messianic movement, whether it's prayer, simple prayer, whether it's political even, or national identity politics, all of a sudden it becomes very important for them. Check the history. Whenever Jews are not around, or not asking, or not demanding, it's overgrown. We have pictures from the Jordanian period. You can see the grass coming through all the rocks. You can see everything dirty. No one's paying attention. It, it, Boggles the mind, but think about it. If you are not what you are, except by what someone else wants of you, it's not enough. You have to be what you are, because what you want to be. If there's nothing positive driving you, you're not there. Don't depend on someone else for praise, and don't depend on someone else even for criticism, to challenge you. 
Be who you are because you are you. Um, with my remaining time, that's what happens when you bring too many pieces of paper. The issue at hand is very simple. The Temple Mount was the site where Isaac was bound. It was the site where the altar was erected. It was the site where the first temple stood for over 400 years. 70 years later, it was begun to be reconstructed. In fact, they even began to sacrifice without the temple being built. It was the temple that was the stronghold against the Romans. When I bring my groups up there sometimes, I say, yes, we can talk about sacrifices, the sacrifices of the zealots, the sacrifices of the Biryonim, the sacrifices of the Sikari, the sacrifices of the soldiers of Judah Maccabee this holiday. What is Hanukkah all about? Lighting candles, eating sufganiyot, and spinning yourselves around? The rededication of the temple. What do you think the holiday is all about? We have all these secular people loving the holiday of Hanukkah, ignoring what the essence of the holiday was. Okay, you don't want to be religious, or you don't want to be observantly religious, or religiously observant. Everybody has his own decisions to make in life until they get to the afterlife. But, okay. <laughs> but don't you at least recognize and accept what the real essence of the holiday is? We have been at that mount for 3,000 years or so. People have tried to get in. People have tried to memorialize the site. At the end of the Pesach Seder, the festive meal of Passover, we don't say all sorts of things. We say next year in Jerusalem. What do you think we're talking about? I, I know the Jews in Brooklyn and Boca Raton have a problem sometimes with that, but okay. Get to know the reality. If the Jews know the reality, then the Christians will know the reality. And who knows? The Muslims may know the reality. Whether they accept it or not, I don't know. It's kind of funny, though, because in 1924-25, the Waqf began publishing yearly booklets for the tourists who were coming up there. British royalty, if you go back on... Some of these old pictures, you'll see Brit the cousin of Queen Victoria went up there with um, canvas or, or uh, burlap over his boots. Okay, well, there are pictures of those. So famous people were up there. The, la the president who just died, George Bush, right, the father, he was up there. So it's a place of honor and respect, and it should be treated that way if that message is absorbed by the core, and the core develops a language and a semantics that is not, as you mentioned earlier, extreme or radical, but is logical and rational, you get the message across. It may take another few days, another few weeks, but since I have been in the business for 48 years, I can tell you that I am not weakened uh, by uh, the struggle. I have seen a lot of successes over this almost half past century, past half century. And uh, I am excited that this conference has been convened. Uh, I have tried to share as much as I can with Doron and John and uh, one of these days the film might come out with my interview. It's deep in post-production. <laughs> and I want to thank you very much 
for being with us to share a very important historic day. We've taken a new step. There are 15 ascents, as you probably know, for those who've studied the temple um, architecture. Actually, there are a few more, but we won't overburden you with facts and details. Uh, but because there are 15 chapters of the songs of ascents in, in, in the Psalms, you're on an ascent, take the next step. And then take the next step. You don't have to run, you can trip. Okay, as in the Talmud even tells a story about a, a Kohen, a priest who tripped running up on the altar, uh, even without steps. It was very steep. And I want to again urge you to continue and thank you very much for being with us. I hope I've tried to give you a little bit of the information of the past 1800 years on the Temple Mount. Thank you.